All right, so before we get started tonight, let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer, okay? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this night, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to come to you and to come to your word and to, uh, to read about John's revelation of you and how John the Apostle walked with Jesus and saw Jesus. Um, Lord, I pray that we would have the reverence necessary, um, we would have the honor necessary um, to listen to your word, and that, Holy Spirit, you would give understanding and revelation tonight. We just ask for your presence, knowing nothing can be taught and or understood apart from you, Holy Spirit. So we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, so... In Sunday school, we went over a little bit of a summary of the Gospel of John. And what I really wanted to hit home, the main point, was the author of John, right? Who is John the disciple, John the Apostle. Because we'll quickly notice um, that John's Gospel is a lot different from the other Gospels. Um, who can name the other three Gospels for me, real quick? Real quick. Garrett. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referred to as the synoptic gospels. Um, they follow a similar pattern. Or they're they're um, taught in a similar theme. They seem to go in order and to put emphasis on historical events of Jesus' life. His healings, where he went, um, who he talked to, and many of his parables. Um, it's important to recognize that when we jump into John, we're, ju we're jumping into a different type of gospel. John the Apostle was actually a teacher among the churches of Asia. And when John broke his gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were already written and were in circulation. So people were already hearing about Jesus and hearing about the historical life of Jesus when John began to write his gospel. So this makes sense why John's gospel is a little different because he wanted to give a different perspective, more from a teaching slash philosophical perspective than the other gospels did. John included some very interesting conversations, one of which we get John 3.16, right? When God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That comes from a Kind of like a random conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus. But John, from a teaching perspective, saw it very fit and necessary to include this conversation because of the truths that were in it. Okay, so when we jump into John's gospel, it's a lot different from the other three gospels because John's perspective was quite unique. Does that make sense? He wanted to share a different perspective than was already in circulation um, that people knew about. Um, a quick example of how we can see these differences in the gospels, I want us to take a look at Luke chapter 1. Now, Luke was a physician. Okay, actually a Gentile physician. Um, and so what's interesting, interesting about Luke is that you can see his detailed perspective as he goes into the gospel. Let's look at his approach to the gospel of Luke. This is what Luke writes. He says, Many have undertaken or attempted to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed, down, handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the fir very first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. So Luke is writing this account to a man named Theophilus, and you can see his kind of his scholarly, almost you know, doctor, empirical approach to the gospel. He's like, I wanted to compile a narrative that is as accurate as possible, as historically dated as possible, in the right order to the best of my ability. He's like, I've investigated this from the very beginning. I want to present a very, a very highly historically accurate account. That we can see Luke's approach. When we turn to the beginning of John, we quickly see John's approach is quite different than Luke's. This is what John writes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. Now, we're going to break down those verses because you can preach a whole sermon series in just those five verses. But you quickly see the approach John took versus that of Luke, right? Luke was like, here's what happened in the best order according to the best historical detail I can give. John was like, you need to understand the, the poetic and the theological importance of, of the word becoming flesh and who Jesus is. All right, so I want our minds to begin to think this way as we go into the Gospel of John. John was a teacher, and he wanted to teach something very powerful about Jesus' life and about who Jesus is. Um, so as we jump into John, I want us to remember that, and I also want us to remember that John was one of Jesus' closest disciples, right? Jesus had the 70 that he sent out in signs and wonders. Jesus also had his 12 that he trained up individually. But then Jesus also seemed to have his three, James, um, his brother John, which is the author of this gospel, and Peter. James, John, and Peter, those three saw things that the other 12 didn't see. Um, for example, the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus revealed his glorified form and his deity. Um, another example would be when James, John, and Peter saw the raising, um, I believe, of Jairus' daughter. Jesus only allowed those three into the room. So Peter, or I'm um, sorry, John is one of those close three disciples that got to see things that no other, other, no other man has, has seen. 
All right. Um, I tried to think about what kind of analogy would do this justice. The idea that God came to earth in human form, right? the creator of the universe, the God that is outside of time, space, and matter, came to earth in human form. And John got to witness him for three years, very close up, living with God right? in, in the form of man. Um, and I can't help but think of, uh, I can't help but have wonder provoked in me. That if God became a man and visited earth, and there were men who saw him and talked with him and ate with him, who saw what he was like, who saw if he had a sense of humor, who saw if he, like, what was Jesus like? What was God like? John had a front row seat to this. So when I was kind of thinking about, like, well, what provoked wonder in me? Like, what, what, what can I compare this account to? It, it was kind of hard for me. Have you guys ever um, seen the movie Interstellar? It's a space movie, kind of like a sci-fi. Oh, really? That's it? Guys, this is a crazy movie. Really cool. Um, pretty much the premise of Interstellar is that Earth um, has no longer become habitable, and soon Earth's resources are going to run out. So, NASA sends a small team of brave astronauts to pretty much travel into a wormhole that they found in the galaxy, or they found in their solar system, so that they can find another livable planet somewhere beyond our solar system. Okay? It's sci-fi, right? You kind of have to kind of roll with the fiction, right? Um, so the premise is they travel to places and see things that no man or woman has ever seen um, in order to attempt to save humanity. I wanted to show you a quick clip um, when they actually travel into the wormhole that has only been theorized. People have theorized, in the movie, people have theorized what it would be like to travel through a wormhole. These are the first ones to do it in observing what's happening. All right, Dean, you wanna play that clip? Okay, Dean, you could get COVID there. Um, so, <clears throat> the reason why I thought of that clip, now if you guys can follow the principle and the analogy, remember the, the line that he said, we were going beyond dimensions that we've ever seen before. All we can do is record and observe. Now, if this, if this was true, if this actually happened, could you imagine if those people made it back to Earth? People would flock to them. To like, what did you see? What happened past the wormhole? Did you make it to a planet? Is there life out there? You would be flooded with so many questions, right? And we would be like putting them in front of all the cameras. Like, what was it like traveling through a wormhole, seeing what no man or woman has ever seen? And I couldn't, the reason why I thought of this was because how much more, if this is what it is for our cosmos, for space, time, and matter, and going beyond what we can understand, how much more for the creator of space, time, and matter to put on human form, to come to earth, and people to have face-to-face -face conversation with the living God as a man. 
um, I couldn't help but have wonder be provoked in me and be like, dang, if, if we actually understood what it meant that God incar- that God who created time, matter, space, who has all the mysteries of the universe, came to earth and taught as a rabbi, right, and had a ministry for three years, and we had people who had eyewitness accounts, sat at his feet and listened to him, be like, we'd be dying to hear what they said. And John, John, I, I think, has one of the best perspectives of Jesus captured in the Bible. John is actually my favorite gospel. So my hope for sharing that, like, maybe silly analogy, but that's what I thought of. My hope for sharing that analogy is that, guys, when we read and we go into the Gospel of John, we have access to the Word of God and a perspective that is beyond valuable that we, we, can't, really, we can't really measure. Right? So I want you guys to have that reverence. And, and my hope is that you would have the wonder, um, the wonder provoke in you. Like, wow, well, what did Jesus say? What did God in the flesh have to say to humanity as we go into the Gospel of John? All right? Sound good? Yes? Okay. All right. So we're going to tackle John 1, verses 1 through 5, right? The, the, the short intro that I read earlier. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in Him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. So we're reading the Gospel of John, and we know that, well, the Gospels are about Jesus. Yet, the first five verses mention nothing of Jesus. Yet, he's talking about something called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So right off the bat, we see some very interesting language. We understand that the Word was with God, um, but was also himself God. And it was in the beginning, so this Word was uncreated. John goes on to refer to this Word as a he. So very strange, right? In the beginning was the Word. Right? What, is, what does that mean? When I used to hear that, that the Word became flesh, or in the beginning was the Word, I just used to think the Bible. I'm like, well, the Word of God, right? Our written Bible. As if God was chilling up there with a King James Version, English translation, leather-bound Bible up, up in heaven before the beginning of time. Right? I used to think it was the written Word of God. But we need to remember that John's Gospel was written 2,000 years ago to a completely different audience than us. So we kind of have to jump into the shoes of the audience that was reading John's gospel to understand what John's intent was to communicate. This term word, right, in the beginning was the word, this would provoke a different thinking in the minds of the Jewish readers at the time. For example, the Old Testament is flooded with this term, the word. And I have a couple of examples for you guys to kind of jump in the minds of the Jewish readers if they were reading John's gospel. For example, in Psalm 33, 6, it says this, The heavens were made by the word of the Lord, and all the stars by the breath of, breath of his mouth. So this idea of the word was that God spoke, and through his very words, life came into existence. Things were created. Things manifested in the physical reality. God brought space, time, and matter into existence through his very words. And we, <clears throat> and we know this from Genesis 1. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. It says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. So, when God spoke, there was creative power in His words to create life. Okay? In His very words, life came into being. And this is what John is touching on. Look what he says in John 1, verses 4 to 5. He says, life was in Him, referring to the Word. Life was in Him, and that life was the light of men. Genesis 1, right? He spoke, light came into being. But he's saying, in those very words, in the very word of God, there was life. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. Now guys, there's there's a lot of theological stuff in this one verse here, um, or these two verses. Light can refer to wisdom as well. Um, Light can refer to the beginning, where we said, let there be light. We're going to take a very brief um, overview of this passage, right? So there's there's many more meaning to this verse, but I just, just as a disclaimer. Um... So we see John say life was in him. Life was in the word. The very word had life in it. Okay? This means that the word, that the means through which life enters the physical world, the means through which it enters is God's word. So when we think about, when we see this, in the beginning was the word, I I want us to move away from the idea of the Bible, right? Although the, the Bible is the word of God. Right, but we need to kind of jump in the shoes of the readers of the time. I want to move away from the, our thinking of the written Bible. Um, and also I want to move away from the idea of our words as like an, an utterance, like just a, just a term. Right? It was the speaking of God. It was, it was the means through which God desired that f- the physical universe would be made, which is his very words. I kind of couldn't help but think of this analogy in my head that if God was walking through a garden and he just commanded things to start growing, 
right? And life was just sprouting, right? He would look to a flower and say, grow, and just, it just grows, right? He looks to a tree and says, you know, grow, and he commands a tree and just before his very eyes grows, right? Because God's words carried creative power. They carried life in themselves, okay? So my first, um, my first point of the night is the words of God carry the life of God in itself. The words of God carry the life of God in itself. In other words, the word itself is living. I want you to try to follow this. This is, this is kind of philosophical. Okay? It's going to stretch your mind. I need you to, to, to stay with me. The very words of God inside the words of God carry life. Like there's power inside the words of God. God is life and when he speaks, life comes from his mouth. Are you, are you following that? It's, it's a little trippy, right? But think about it. When he spoke, light came into being. When he spoke, life came into being. It's because his very words have creative power. Um, I like to think about the word of God as the enactor of his will, right? Because God is a mind. He has a will and a desire. So when he speaks, his will comes to pass. And the word of God is the means through which his will comes to pass. Um, I have um, the word is the manifestation of his being, right? God is an unseen mind. When he speaks, he reveals himself. Right? Um, and is the communicator of his mind. We can kind of start to see the Trinity relationship in, in the, these first five verses. I want you guys to try to stay with me on this, right? God and his word are the same, but also separate. Think about this. If somebody says to you, I'm as good as my word, or you have my word, or someone says, I am my word, what are they saying? They're saying, my promise to you, what I say is an exact representation of who I am. I am my word. Right? Take me for my word. Take me for my word. Let my word accurately represent me. Although the word is not me, it's an exact representation of me. You follow that? In the same way, the word of God is the exact expression of who God is. Right? God is spirit. God is a mind. You, we can't see God just like we can't see your minds here. But when he speaks, he manifests who he is. So we start to see this strange trinity relationship. That the word and God are the same but separate persons. Okay? So my second point of the night. His word is the means through which God is made known in the perceivable universe. I know there's some big words there. His word is the means through which God is made known in the perceivable universe. In other words, God is unknowable apart from his word because he is a mind. Okay? God must manifest or reveal himself through his word. Right? Um, and we can see this with, with anything. Um, I brought the example up before of an artist. An artist has an idea in his or her mind, and in order to communicate that idea, he has to paint something. He has to create something. Right? In the same way, the Word of God is God's manifestation of his mind, of his heart, of his character. It's the exact representation of God. Are you guys following me? Right? You guys understand that concept? Um, is there a question? You, right, you can ask a question, sure. To John 14.6? I think it does. I think many um, instances throughout John's gospel is constant reference back to this, uh, this one central truth, which is that God came in the form of Jesus, or Jesus was God in, in the flesh. In John 14.6? Yeah. Well, we're going to get there in 13 chapters, um, and we're going to see that tie in. John is almost setting the thesis paragraph, in a way, of the rest of the gospel. So that's a good point. He does touch on this concept all throughout the gospel, which is why we need to understand the starting place of John's, of John's approach, right? Okay, um, does that make sense, guys? I want us to, to recognize that John, in these first five verses, isn't introducing a new concept. I used to read, in the beginning was the word, I'm like, whoa, what is John talking about? John is really just referencing what Jews already knew and believe at the time. But yeah, the word is the enactor of God's will. It's the manifestation of God through his word. Things change through his word. People are healed. Um, it reveals who he is. So John wasn't really laying down anything new for the Jews. Okay, this was a concept they understood. And interestingly enough, the Greeks or the non-believing people or right, the non-Jews of the time actually had an understanding of that term, the word, as well. Um, so, for example, um, or, or to elaborate... John's use of the word, the word, in the Greek, it's the term logos. Okay, so when John wrote his gospel, he said, in the beginning was the logos, in Greek. So Jewish, Jewish readers would be, oh, the logos, yes, the enactor of God's will. We read about that in the Old Testament. The Greek readers would be like, oh, the logos, yes. They had a philosophical understanding of the term logos. For example, it's where we get our term in English, logic. It's kind of interesting, right? We derive our English word logic 
from the Greek understanding of the term logos. And that's the word John uses in this, in this passage. In the beginning was the logos. So the, <clears throat> the non-believing Greeks, especially those who are heavily influenced by Plato. You guys heard of Plato the philosopher? I'm sure you guys have done a little bit in high school um, with that stuff. Plato was a philosopher. He introduced a lot of different concepts and ideas. Um, one of those that he was popular for uh, teaching on was the idea of the Logos, or um, it could be translated in a way, divine reason, or the divine mind, or, or the mode through which truth is known. Now, Plato didn't ascribe any, um, ascribe any uh, personal things to the Logos, but there was just an understanding in Greek thought that there was something out there. There was some kind of mind. There was some kind of truth, some kind of reason. Um, it wasn't necessarily personal, um, it wasn't necessarily good, but it was some kind of truth out there and by which we get our own reasoning faculties, by which we can understand nature around us. So, when, so John is kind of a genius because John is using a term that both non-believing Greeks and Jews will look at and be like, oh yeah, I know the Logos, right? I know the, the, ultimately the mind behind the universe, right? The divine reason, the ultimate wisdom, the ultimate truth. So when John was, had, was talking in the beginning, um, Jews and non-believing Greeks probably would have read those first verses and be like, yeah, in the beginning was God, and the Word, the Logos, was God. They'd probably be like, yeah, that, that makes sense. We understand that. Until John says what he says in verse 14. He says this, The Word, the Logos, became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now John is laying down a new theology point. He's saying that that mind behind the universe became a man, took up flesh, and I, I viewed him. Right? He goes on to say, no one has ever seen God, right? God is spirit. The one and only son, the one who is at the father's side, he has revealed him. The word has revealed him. So John was saying that that, that word, the word, right, to the Jew and to the Greek, that we've heard of, we've seen, we philosophize, philosoph We've thought about, right? This concept of the word, the mind of God, became flesh. And we actually lived with him and talked with him and ate with him and drank with him. He taught. The very word, the very mind of God became manifest, put on flesh, right? So in John 14, or John 1 14, that's when John's making the bold claim, the Christian claim. Like, yeah, we all believe in something out there, but I'm telling you that the mind that created the universe became flesh, and I, I saw him, I talked with him, I walked with him. This was a radical idea, mainly because, you guys have to understand, Jesus was known as the Messiah, and Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah, with little hints of his deity, right? The fact that Jesus was God, and John will get into that um, more in more detail throughout the gospel. But the idea that Jesus was the Messiah was, was a common, um, was not hard for Jews to swallow in the sense of, yeah, we're waiting for a Messiah because of the Old Testament. But the idea that the Messiah would come as God himself in flesh was a new idea. This was, a, this was a strange concept. And we see John, especially John and Paul, reference this many times throughout their, throughout their words. The very, very word of God took on flesh to become the promised Messiah. That God himself would come in flesh and become the king. This, this was a radical idea. And, and I don't want you to think about that the word, right, the, the manifestation of God's being, right? I don't want you to think that the word merely put on flesh and became a man kind of like a jacket. And then he could take it off whenever. That's not what Jesus chose to do. The word came in flesh in the sense of he became fully man. Right? Fully God and fully man. He was born into the world. He died as a man. Right? The word didn't, didn't cut any corners. God didn't want to just put on flesh, tell, tell us how it is, and then just take off his, his flesh jacket and go back up to heaven. The word was born into a woman. Right? The virgin birth of Mary. Right? And then he died. A horrible death, death of crucifixion. In other words, the word did not cut any corners. Jesus became man in the fullest sense. God became man in the fullest sense. And, which is interesting to me, Jesus is still a man right now, right? Fully God, fully man. But he's still in his glorified body in heaven reigning as a man. The whole point is that God wanted to come and be the physical king of the world. He wanted to be the savior of humanity himself. He's like, mankind can't do it. I'm going to have to put on flesh and I'm going to have to do it myself. And when he did that, Jesus took on flesh and then was glorified in the Father's presence. Is, is right now sitting at the right hand of God in his glorified body. He didn't take off his humanity. Jesus, when he returns, he's going to come as the man God he is. Fully God, fully man. Do you, does that make sense to you guys? When Jesus was taken up into heaven, he didn't take off his, his manhood. He remained a man. That's powerful. That's a, that's a very mysterious truth. 
So my third point of the evening, Jesus is the greatest mystery in the universe. Jesus is the greatest mystery in the universe. Everything that God is, the mind of God, the word of God that communicated who he was. We've seen traces of him throughout the Old Testament, right? The Jews were always looking for, well, what was the word of the Lord? What did the word say? This word put on human form, became a man. Very life itself, right? Because the word carries life within itself. The very word itself, the very life itself became a man. Perfect truth, perfect justice, perfect peace, perfect love, perfect joy. Became a man to save the world from evil. Um, this is helpful for me to think of the gospel in this way because this is the greatest possible truth ever. That God himself, full of love and kindness, John says we, we've observed grace and truth, kindness and mercy when God revealed himself to save humanity from evil. Right? So this is what it means when the word, this is what it means that the word became flesh. All right? Um, so that's kind of like a quick intro into the gospel of John. Um, I want you guys to kind of have this understanding of Jesus being God fully in the flesh as, as John lays this out for us as we go through the gospel. Um, and remember, guys, John had a front row seat to this. Um, my hope for, for you tonight was to provoke some kind of wonder, some kind of um, just captivation with the idea that the, the hidden creator of, of, of all time manifested himself in the man. He, he was born of a virgin. God became, God became a 12-year-old at one point. We have a little bit of writings about uh, Jesus as a 12-year-old. But he was God in the flesh. And this is what John wanted to, to record and write and emphasize this point all throughout his gospel. We're going to see many references, as Jordan brought up, um, how Jesus refers to his deity in slight little comments. And if you're looking for it, you can see that Jesus was fully God when he came to earth. Um, does anybody, before we break for houses, because I know this was kind of more of like a teaching perspective rather than preaching, does anybody have any questions right off the bat that they want to ask about the word becoming flesh? Um, I, go ahead, Marcus. So was there a difference? Um, like having the form of Jesus, is there, there, there's, a, there's a point where when Jesus comes in, there is a difference between what it meant before. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so pretty much any other appearances of the word before Jesus, what's the difference between that and then the actual incarnation when Jesus was born, so to speak? Yeah. Um, well, so... To answer that quickly, there are many instances in the Old Testament where Jesus appears, where the word becomes a man, but in the sense of he put on manhood and he kind of came out. Um, for example, in Genesis, three men visit Abraham, and it says that that was God visiting Abraham. It's very interesting. It kind of gets your mind going, like three men visit Abraham and that was God. It's very strange. Um, another example is Joshua. When Joshua crosses over, I believe it was the Jordan River, um, he sees a man who looks like an angel with a sword at his hand, a sword drawn. And the, the angel tells him, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. And Joshua fell and worshipped him. Um, scholars believe, and I also agree, that, that that was Jesus, the angel of the Lord. You'll see this reference all throughout the Old Testament. Last example, see, you wound me up with, with uh, theology. When um, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. You guys know that story? Yeah. It says, the angel of the Lord was in the burning bush. But then the bush says, I am the Lord your God. So, was it the angel in the bush? Um, like, a, just a messenger of God? Well, then why did the angel itself say, I am the Lord your God? It's a manifestation of the word. Angel can just mean messenger. So we see many examples of uh, the Trinity, even in the Old Testament, if you're looking for it. On many strange instances where it says the angel of the Lord came and said, I am the Lord your God. Do you, you see what I'm saying? So there are manifestations of Jesus in the Old Testament, but never has the word actually become fully man in the sense of born through a woman, growing up as a child. And that's the mystery that, that at least I think is incredible. Like, what was God like as a nine-year-old? That's a crazy question, crazy concept. And we don't have much about that, but we can wonder. Any other questions before we break up into our houses? Okay, you have about 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to pray us out before we go. Hold up, Christian. I'm going to pray us out, and then you guys um, answer the questions. I want you to have some good discussion. Let's pray. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we know that we can't begin to understand the incarnation and what it means that Jesus is fully man and fully God and is currently a man ruling in heaven right now. Um, we just ask, Lord, would you begin to reveal that to us? Show us what that means. Um, put 
wonder in our hearts. Put, uh, captivate us, God. This is a, quite a mystery, and it, it's exciting to understand. So, Lord, I just pray that you would bless us with revelation tonight. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.